Welcome to the First Down Legacy Podcast, your gateway to the exciting world of multifamily real estate investing. If you're eager to discover the strategies, insights, and success stories that will take your investment game to the next level, you've come to the right place. In each episode, we delve deep into the multifamily investing arena, sharing expert advice, interviews with industry leaders, and valuable tips to help you build your own legacy through multifamily real estate. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, our podcast is your playbook for scoring big in the world of multifamily family investing. Join us as we explore the ins and outs of multifamily properties, uncover the latest market trends, and learn from those who have already achieved remarkable success in this dynamic field. Get ready to huddle up and tackle multifamily investing like a pro. This is the First Down Legacy Podcast, where your journey towards financial prosperity begins. Let's get started. So welcome, Zach, to the First Down Legacy Podcast. You know, it's an honor to have uh, a military veteran here on the show with us, and that's now a multifamily or real estate uh, investor. Much for having me on today. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, kind of going going through just my story and how I got started and uh, sharing some of my experiences and hopefully uh, my, you know, the the stories that I have and talking about my journey, you know, will be helpful to uh, some other people who are either looking to get started or are uh, looking for guidance along their path. Awesome. Yeah, man, that's exactly what we're doing here. You know, we dive into the multifamily space or as far as real estate investing um, and, and how you were transi- able to transition outside the military into real estate investing. Um, so how long did you serve for? Yeah, so I was in the Army for six years, uh, predominantly as a reserve. I my I was based out of Massachusetts, a unit in Massachusetts. I um, I, my, my specificity in the military, I began working as a uh, mechanic on a lot of the upper armored vehicles. And then I shifted due to my unit's uh, needs to shift to supply. And that was predominantly where I spent most of my time in the military. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So during the military, what what was your first introduction into real estate investing? How, how did that come about? I uh, hmm. I don't per se think that my experience in the military, quote unquote, led to me diving into real estate investing. But I do think that being in the military helped me surrounding my real estate investing journey. And what okay. I mean by and what I mean by that is, uh. I think having access to my VA loan through the military was certainly advantageous in in that process. I also think that secondarily, one of the biggest advantages that played a pivotal role in in my ability to uh, kind of dive into real estate investing was the fact that I was able to use the, the education based benefits that the military offers to effectively graduate college debt free with a degree. And simultaneously, I was actually with with my financial aid package and the GI Bill, I was actually getting paid to go to school. So okay. on average, I was making somewhere between eight to twelve thousand dollars a year to while I was going to college and I was also working full time. And that played a pivotal role in me kind of building up uh, a sound foundation of funds that allowed for me to, in the future, pursue uh, my first purchase. Okay. So did you always uh, have that in mind? Um, Or is that something that was uh, like started brewing as you were in school? Yeah. uh, Funny story, actually. so as a young kid, uh, we, my, my family rented from, um, my family rented, you know, most of the, most of my life growing up. And when I was really young, I didn't quite understand the concept. And so, you know, my mom, I remember asking question to my mom when I was a young kid and I, I asked and I, I asked my mom you know, who the person was that was coming over and and why they were collecting money from us. And my mom said, oh, that guy, you know, that this guy owns the house. And, you know, my response to that was, I said, well, no, this is our house. 
Yeah. And then, so my response, you know, my mom's response to that was, well, no, we don't own the house. We just rent it. And I said, well, what does that mean? And she said, well, that person bought the house and we pay him to live in it. Yeah. And I said, so he owns it and then we pay him the money. So I said, he just gets money for free. And my mom's response was like, no, he gets money. And then when he bought the house, he has to make payments to the bank, but he gets to keep some money too. And I said, so what if, and then, so as a young kid, I may be, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old. And I'm thinking about this to myself. And I said, so what if you owned a bunch of them? And she's like, well, you would get a lot of, you, you would make the payments to the bank, but you effectively would get a lot of money too. Yeah. And I said, and I said, so why don't we do that? <laughs> and my mom was like, it's, it's not that easy. And I was like, it seems pretty easy. Okay. And so at that point I was, you know, nine, 10 years old. And I was like, why, like, why would I, why, why would anybody not do this? Um, and it became something I was interested in. I took some, I took actually my high school, my high school actually had a program where if you were interested in a specific topic, they had a partnership with an online education uh, provider in which you could receive high school credits for taking an online course in that topic if they didn't offer it. And that was the first time I took a real estate investing based course was at my high school uh, where I was able to do it online and learn about a concept that wasn't offered in, in school. And so that was sort of my, that sort of opened my eyes to the situation and started to very lightly inform me. And then yeah. when I went, when I went to college, I, I was set on majoring in business and I ended up majoring in business. And I was actually, there was, there was a real estate based course in college as well that I also took because it was of interest to me. And those were probably, you know, the first, that conversation plus those two education based opportunities were probably my first exposure to the concept yeah man talk about you know what an advantage that, that's awesome for you that you're able to uh you know take a course like that in high school uh when when most you know obviously a lot of kids are not even thinking about that type of future but um you know i, I know for certain that during that time uh as a high schooler i definitely was not taking any action towards you know a, a future in real estate however <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. However, I always uh, knew, you know, subconsciously that I wanted, you know, that I was business minded, that I I love the transitions between um, with the possibilities that come with owning uh, or being a business owner. So fast forward, fast forward about um, five years, 10 years. What was your first purchase on? As a real estate investor, did you focus solely in the residential or did you jump right into multifamily? Um, what was your strategy there? Yeah, so just to dive in a little bit. Um, when I was in, when I was in, when I first graduated college, I got my first apartment and the apartment that I had um, was a really divey apartment in, in uh, a town, you know, 15 or 20 minutes away from where I was working. And uh, during that time, my main prerogative was to live somewhere as cheap as possible, as proximal to my work as possible that would allow for me to work as much as possible. And in doing that, I was able to save a decent amount of money. Um, I, I had lived with random roommates. Um, the apartment was very disheveled and, you know, was not in good condition. Uh, my now wife at the time was my girlfriend and she ended up moving into the apartment and sharing my room with me with random roommates it was a pretty crazy situation and um we so it, there reached a point where you know that had run its course and you know we we we, we were basically saying you know it's time to kind of get out of here and, and make a move and my main concern was I didn't even think about operating from a standpoint of getting into multifamily at the time. I was thinking about trying to maximize value. And so uh, 
I was looking, you know, could we buy something that's more value add? Could we buy something that you could add bedrooms? Could we buy something where you could, you know, turn it around and, and ultimately, you know, you're building equity in the short term while not paying rent. And I wanted to get something where the monthly payment was also cost affordable so that I wouldn't be sort of making myself house poor. And I hadn't even considered the possibility of doing something multifamily oriented. And what I ended up doing is we bought a, a townhouse where we were able to add a third bedroom and versus, you know, having bought it as a two bedroom. And so um, the property that we had bought had been on the market for, you know, 40 or 50 something days. Um, we negotiated a pretty good price. We negotiated a seller credit. Um, we were able to get into the property at a third bedroom. We lived there for about a year, year and a half. And um, that was sort of our first purchase. And we ended up making a decent amount of money on that. But really what transcended the mindset toward um, the multifamily option was effectively the start of sort of COVID-19. Uh, I, I, I was essentially starting my own business. And one of my main concerns in starting my own business was risk mitigation. And so, you know, financial risk mitigation. And so what I, what I determined at that time was that one of the most plausible ways for me to mitigate financial risk in order for my, you know, for me to have success with my business was to, re you know, reduce the financial burden that is making a monthly mortgage payment. So what I determined was I could roll the equity that I had in my existing house into a multifamily property in which I could live there for free and then rent out the other half and pay for the mortgage. So I ended up doing that which then corresponded into me, you know, not having to make a monthly mortgage payment, which allowed for me to reinvest money back into my business and garner success that way. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing technique there. I mean, the, uh, talk about a little bit about the mindset and the sacrifices, you know, that you had to go through, um, right. Whether it was burdensome for a while or not, but you always had the, the bigger vision, um, you know, for the next step. So talk to me a little bit about the mindset there to get to, you know, the wife along on the same page, what does that vision look like? Yeah, so I think that in regards to <clears throat> the process with my with my wife, uh, I think that her what I what I did is I worked backwards. I said, "Tell me in life, you know, what would be ideal for you? What would you like?" You know, what would you like from a housing standpoint? What would you like from a lifestyle standpoint? What would you like from, um, you know, what kind of life do you want to live? How do you want to have a family together? How do you want the dynamic to be surrounding our ability to spend time with each other, with our kids, so on and so forth? And how do we make that possible? And so, you know, looking at it from a standpoint of working backwards, I said, hey, here's the things you want. And I said, ultimately, you and I want the same things. We want this type of house. We want this type of family arrangement. We want to have freedom to be able to spend time with our kids. And in order to achieve those things, I, you know, what I said is ultimately that would be a lot easier to do. And we would have more liberty to be able to do those things in the event that we had extra streams of income. And so what I had laid out to her is I said, this is an opportunity for us to take this time to pursue those options. And what I said is I kind of laid it out for her and I said, hey, if if you, you know, if you were to go buy a property that is a multifamily based option, you would effectively have to put down 20 to 25 percent in order to buy that property on the open market as an investment property. I said one of the massive benefits that you can utilize is you can put a low down payment loan option on a multifamily property if you intend to own or occupy that property and you can effectively do that once every six to nine months. And what I said to her is I said, you know, at the age that we are at now, when do you want to start having kids? And so she gave me sort of a parameter. And at the time we were probably 25, 26 years old. And I said, okay, so by 31, you know, you want to be starting to have kids. And she said, yes. And I said, okay, so at 31, you want to start having kids. You probably want some time off of work. You know, we want to be in a single family home. So what I said to her is I said, ultimately, you know, that's a five year runway. So I said, what can we possibly do in the next five years on that five year runway to, to, to yield the best outcome for our future together? And so that's sort of <clears throat> when I mapped it out that way. And I said, hey, are you down to kind of sacrifice the quality over the next five years in order to make that reality happen? 
And I think that when I laid it out that way and I, you know, I sort of mapped out the benefits, but then also mapped out like the, the long-term benefits for our, our family dynamic and our lifestyle. I think that she was super on board in supporting that. And I also think that, it, I, you know, me having a background um, in having a business degree, going to school for finance and accounting, it, it, it created some trust in that, in that as well. Yeah, that's super important to have that, um, you know, a dynamic team there, you know, to jump on the same, uh, on the same vision and, and execute to, you know, to a certain extent. Um, so let's talk about your first uh, multifamily project. You know, did you, what kind of structure did you use there? Was it a duplex, fourplex, something that you and your wife were operating? Or did you immediately uh, jump into syndicating, you know, for, for a, you know, for a 30, 20 unit? How was that first experience for you? Sure. So uh, I bought a duplex. I roll. So because I was in my, I was in business for myself for less than two years, I was not able to obtain conventional financing. Uh, I had to actually go through a portfolio lender rather than going through uh, sort of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac products. And so I pursued a portfolio lender. I had to put 20% down in order to buy the first multifamily property. And uh, I was able to use some of the equity that I had acquired in the townhouse that we had owned and converted uh, by adding an extra bedroom to upon the liquidation and sale of that <clears throat> to roll into that duplex option and i was able to come up with the difference um we bought the property the downstairs contained three bedrooms with a plausibility of adding a fourth and the upstairs contained four bedrooms so it was effectively you know seven bedrooms two bath um one of the one of the unique things was that on the listing when the property was listed, it was actually listed as a five bed, two, uh, two bath. And part of that was because the pitch in the ceilings in the, at, in the attic bedrooms actually didn't constitute legally as them being deemed legal bedrooms. So the benefit for me was that I was actually, so, you know, I, as you know, just in general, you know, seasoned real estate investors aren't per se looking on the MLS for, duplexes that's probably you know you you all grow that pretty quickly um and so to that point i think that a lot of the people who are looking on the mls who are looking for duplexes are relatively novice or or a little bit smaller scale um in terms of you know what they're looking you know looking to acquire those options so i think that there probably was some semblance of oversight the pictures on it were really poor they were very they were not professionally done uh both of the tenants that occupied both units were very uh disorganized and there was a lot of clutter um the units were not the units were not in good condition optically and so what we ended up doing was uh we submitted an offer on the property we asked for the prop we submitted an offer on the property for over asking price and we asked for both the units i said the contingency was we are willing to pay this price in the event that you're willing to vacate both the tenants and mm -hmm. okay. um the owner the owner was um I, I didn't realize how rare this was actually but the owner was complicit in doing both of those things so we actually ended up paying uh north of what the asking price was um, we ended up getting both of the units vacant. We ended up doing some restorations on the on both of the units. We ended up com converting the additional space into a fourth bedroom. And um, you know, fast forward, uh, where we stand presently is, I bought the property for five hundred and ten thousand dollars. I put about forty thousand dollars into it, so I'm probably all in for five fifty. And the two the they're the two units themselves um one rents for 3600 and the other one rents for 3500 so total uh we're making 7100 gross we're in it for 550 um and the pit so you know 7100 the pity on it per month principal interest taxes and insurance is like roughly a little bit over 2500 bucks amazing yeah that's uh that's amazing and that's ideal there uh the, you know the way you did it 
Um, talk about a portfolio lender. What was the interest rates there, especially starting out? Um, you know, how, how were you able to navigate through that? You know, with the current market um, at the time that you did it, compared to the portfolio lender. Yeah, sure. So I didn't. Um, every time that I went to a traditional lender, I just hit roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. So I actually reached out to uh, a bunch of people on the Bigger Pockets forum and actually asked for somebody who was experienced to make a recommendation um, surrounding pursuit of a portfolio lender option because I realized that that may be the most plausible strategy. And they referred me to somebody. And I think that the fact that I was able to name drop somebody who they had a favorable relationship with ultimately helped me to begin with. Excuse the interruption, but I have a very important message for each and every one of you. If you've made it through the video this far, it could only mean that you are ready to take your multifamily career to the next level. If you book a call with me in the link below, I can show you step by step on how I've been able to create passive income, build a legacy I've always wanted, and turn my dreams into a reality. Book a call with me now, and I too can show you how to align your purpose through multifamily investing. Let's go. And then I think once I got my foot in the door and entered that situation, uh, I was able to explain my circumstance. And I think that uh, that aided in that whole process. Uh, what I will say is that that was in the beginning of like early 2020, uh, sort of toward, toward the like fall of 2020. And I think that translated into rates at that time were still extremely advantageous. Uh, I ended up getting a 10-1 arm at at the time uh, it was like a 3375, which which now looks like pure gold. So, uh, yeah, 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 um, advantageous for sure. I mean, was that fast forward two years later, two and a half years later from that, you know, the, the interest rates now, um, yeah, it's not favorable to continue to 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 get a conventional loan, and it would actually make more sense to find. Uh, a portfolio lender or some type of hard money lender that can offer, you know, a, a, about a point or two below um, current interest rates. Um, did you hear about the Fannie Mae approved uh, to lower, like, I believe it was like a 5% down payment on, on like one of four, one of one four flexes. Yeah. So it's funny yeah. that you mentioned that. Um, I'm actually eligible for a house hack right now. I just went through this whole process with my lender. Um, I added my wife's job and income to the mix, and um, we just got we just got pre qualified for uh, for we just got pre qualified for a fourplex, um, 1.2 to 1.5, five percent down. So I'm yeah. excited to start for that. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I'm going to do my some more research and see where I can get in, whether it's a, a two-plex, four-plex, or, or see what's going on there. Um, because you got to take advantage of, of times like this, for sure. 100%, 100%. And with the rules, the rules are always changing. That's one of the things that's so crazy about this is that it's like every every year, every six months, rules change. Rules change with lenders about uh owner-occupied products, rules change with lenders surrounding home equity line products, rules change surrounding uh, depreciation styles. Uh, there's so many variables in regards to how things change. And I think it's really important to either seek out people who are aware of those changes and to educate yourself or to um, you know educate yourself uh, independently. Yes, for sure. Um, I'm it's awesome that you brought that up, you know, as far as educating yourself. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that um, on where you began and, you know, and what it took to actually begin and take an action? Yeah. Um, I, I began listening to Bigger Pockets podcast in the beginning of early 2020. I was at the time, I, right as COVID hit, uh, I was working full-time as a personal trainer um, at a luxury high-end gym called Equinox. I'm sure many people are familiar with that. Um, and at the time, you know, when the when basically the whole state and the whole country pretty much shut down, what I effectively did is I ended up trading in my car, buying a pickup, 
putting a whole bunch of equipment in the back of my truck. And I was driving around house to house to house with all my clients, um, training them outside, training them in their garage um, and, and that kind of thing, because people were so bored and so eager to do something that resembled their normal life. And I'm, I was able to get creative with how I was able to offer that in a way that people felt comfortable with during that time. And during that time, when I was driving around house to house to house, uh, it would effectively be me training a client and then me driving from that person to the next person, listening to bigger pockets. And I just did that all day, every day for, you know, probably close to nine months. And at the nine month marker, that was when I was able to, to buy that first property and from that point forward, I began setting goals on how many books I would read per year. Um, my first year, I started with one book per month and did 12 books. My second year, um, I doubled it and I said 24 books per year, two books per month. Um, and that those two years were pretty instrumental in my learning process. And what I would also say as well is um, I, I very quickly realized that one of the largest values in in this community in this real estate investing space is being able to learn from people who have been there before you and so what i began doing was i actually began attending local meetups in my area and tried to start attending as many meetups as i could and actually the first meetup that i ended up going to is where i actually met my now business partner who i do all my deals with and uh, that's just a testament to how much value you can gain from going to local meetups. Uh, I actually now run a meetup and co-host a meetup with that same business partner. I have found off-market deals and that I have acquired at meetups. I have found people who have invested in deals that I have done at meetups. Um, you name it. My I met yeah. my attorney. I met my attorney at a meetup. I met my con so I met contractors at meetups. Like yeah, the list goes on. Yeah, amazing. Uh, that's that's a great way to, to build up your network there. Um, yeah, you talk about <clears throat> investors, you know, at meetups, the partners, um, you know, your attorneys, contractors, those are all things that are needed to have in your contact list when you're pursuing, you know, a multifamily deal here. So let's talk about the syndication process. Um, is that the structure that you use in order to tackle these big uh these big uh, multifamily properties? Yeah, so I've done one syndication so far, and then I've done um, one JV um, that was a little bit larger. And then predominantly every other deal that I've done has been pretty much JV structure. JV um, structure, okay. Yeah, JV being joint venture. Um, yeah. in, those in those circumstances, most of the properties that we're talking about are anywhere between um, two and two and 10 units. Um, we're normally bringing in one, two, three, you know, four investors, and then myself and my partner are functioning as the operators. Uh, habitually, we're bringing some capital to the deal as well. Um, in re but uh, we, we have done one syndication for a really large acquisition that was uh, 69 units. 69 units. And that's based out of uh, where you're from, Do you, like in your backyard, or is that out of state or... What does that look like? Yeah, that 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 one is uh, roughly an hour away from where I live. It's it's in South Coast, Massachusetts, in a town called New Bedford. It is. Uh, it's about it's like C class. Uh, we acquired. Uh, it was a portfolio that was being liquidated from an individual who passed away. His family inherited the properties. Uh, they liquidated the twelve buildings, the entire portfolio to us, and. Um, our strategy was to effectively buy the properties, improve, improve the performance of the properties, and then liquidate them one by one and to sell off eight of the properties that we did not want to return all of the capital to investors. And then effectively, we would keep four properties. And out of those four properties, I think they contain a total of 32 units, which is almost half. So right. we end up we end up selling eight properties, keeping four, returning all the capital to the investors, 
and then we just own you know 32 units um, that will you know perpetually generate cash flow for us and our investors moving forward. Okay, and at this point, um, your you know your track record is obviously building up. Um, you know, being able to speak for itself. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what it takes to raise capital for these type of deals? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing when you start talking about raising capital for deals, one of the big things that I have done in regards to my smaller deals is taking all my owner occupied deals that I have done, taking any JVs that I have done with my with my immediate partner and then using those to convey proof of concept to begin speaking to people who may be interested in doing deals with you. I think that's step one. And I think mapping out very clearly on paper, how much equity did you increase, the, you know, how much equity did you gain from like a forced appreciation standpoint surrounding your house hacks? How much, uh, how much were you able to increase the rents on those properties? How much cash flow do those properties generate versus the amount of capital in the deal? And, I think it's very important to to that your first two or three deals be very very solid in terms of the metrics because I think when you show solid metrics your ability to put that in front of somebody else and for them to see the validity of your skills I think is really powerful in your ability to scale and I think that on another note I think another huge important piece that really has amplified our ability to scale is I think, yeah, like networking, going to meetups, things like that. But I think more importantly is from inception, creating a CRM where you can input all of your contacts, input your personal contacts, input anytime you go to a meetup, your number one prerogative is to collect contacts. How many contacts can I meet tonight? How many people's information can I get? And then putting them all in your CRM. So now what ends up happening is every time you come across a deal, you can pump it out to your CRM. Every time you come across something that you don't want, that maybe you'd be down to wholesale, you can pump it out to your CRM. Anytime you do a deal and you do a good job, you can pump out the results to your CRM so everybody sees what you're doing and how well you're doing. And I think Correct. that to that, I think to that point, I think another really uh, valid piece here, this is something that we have started instituting as well over the last year is we act now when you have a decent amount of volume, what we do is we actually put out a monthly newsletter. So we actually put out, hey, here's what we did on this project. Here's what happened over the last month. Here's some of the moves that we're making. So now we're constantly in the inboxes of all the people that we know, and they're seeing all of our work as it's happening in real time. And that we're there, we are sort of constantly on the brain because of the fact that we're always in front of them. Yeah, that's a great strategy there. You talk about CRM and using these automated um, you know, systems in order to build, um, build on your pl the platform that you currently have. Um, that's amazing work that you do there, man. You talk about, you know, you begin going to the meetups and then now you currently host your meetups there in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, man. Uh, great work. Uh, you know, personally, uh, when I began learning about multifamily, uh, it was as early as this year in September. So, you know, so I've been on a mission to just connect with individuals like yourself, right? Almost call it a world tour, um, meeting lives all over to kind of see their journey and how they've navigated through the multifamily space. And, you know, they talk about starting with a duplex, turn into a 12 plex, and then show proving the track record that they did a good job. And now you have individuals wanting to come with you to partner, right, to show to show for it. Um, so that's great work there, man. So currently I work with the Mergers and Acquisitions Group and I funded through these deals on a weekly basis, uh, you know, we fo solely focus on like 50 units and above, but anything um, that comes lower than that, uh, you know, I I, uh, I tend to shoot them out to my contacts, you know, like yourself, like other individuals who are in the multifamily space that could actually run with it. Um, but myself personally, um, I'm looking to close my first indication here with in first uh, in January. And, and what that looks like is um, I, I came on the deal on the backside of it. So the, all the work, all the upfront work had already been done. Um, 
but I came in on the backside of it as a co-sponsor, you know, to get to the, to be able to come in capital raise. And, and I figured that, figured that out, um, you know, especially during the holidays, it, it's tough to raise. And, and as well as me personally, I don't have that track record um, that, that we mentioned that we talked about um, with these individuals, right? So it's like, Hey, like when, when did you start uh, owning and, you know, and occupy, um, operating multifamily. So I essentially have to lean on the track record of my partners, of my, of the main sponsor that they have been doing this for four years. They do have, you know, 200, um, million under, under asset and, and, and that type of stuff. But again, I, I would have to use their track record in order to gain some exposure or gain some credibility that this, that this, uh, the reason why you should invest with us. Right. But, yeah, man, um, in the very beginning stages for me. But again, meeting with individuals like yourself is uh, accelerating that for me uh, by months, by years, being able to connect with uh, successful individuals like yourself. 100%. And it sounds like, it sounds like you know, you got, you got a, a, you're in a good room full of good people that, you know, are trying to make moves and, uh, and that, you know, opening doors to opportunities like that is going to, you know, it's, it's going to, has an impact on changing people's lives. Definitely. Um, well, Zach Gray, I appreciate you, you know, jumping on the First Down Legacy podcast, um, of course, on a Sunday morning. Um, what's what's better than to wake up and talk some business, right? Um, 100%, 100%. I, uh, you know, it's Sunday morning it, to me is has always been like my oasis per se in, in the event of, you know, I use it to get myself right for the week. And I think, uh, you know, what better way to do that than to, you know, sit and talk shop. Okay. Uh, you know, one last thing before we go, uh, before we end the call, what is something that you can talk to uh, or something that you can suggest for, let's say, a beginner or a novice in this field, right? Looking to get their first deal, looking to um, accelerate their career. What, what's one thing that they can take away from it? I think if you're, if you are a beginner and you're looking to get started, I think your number one objective should be to reach out to people in the area who do deals to ask them to intro you to their preferred lending connect connections and to then ask that person to then underwrite your personal financials to get a pre-approval and i think that once you have a pre-approval i think that one the likelihood of you getting the most advantageous rate terms in lending terms, if you're working with somebody's preferred lenders who does deals frequently, means you're already going to seek out and retain, or sorry, obtain the most advantageous lending uh, conditions. And I think that once you get that pre-approval, now you're aware of what you can do surrounding purchase power. And I think at that time, now you can begin exploring options. And I think that in the interim, I think your num once you have that pre-approval and once you are exploring options, I think your num your next step would be to focus on underwriting deals. So find a way whether you are going to use a deal calculator that exists online, or whether you're going to create your own deal calculator um, in like an Excel model. That's ultimately up to you. I think that what be the more deals that you underwrite, the more practice that you put into that space. I think that you're going to very quickly start to understand even just by scrolling uh mls you know redfin zillow things like that you're going to start to be able to catch things that pop out at you as saying hey that that might be a good deal amazing yeah man you talk about the repetition and underwriting right understanding the numbers uh putting a business plan together that's number one for sure so zach where can the people find you uh, on instagram on facebook yeah so you can follow me on instagram uh, my Instagram handle is at the 1099 mindset. Okay. And same, uh, same with Facebook. Uh, yeah. Facebook, you can find me. I'm, I'm just on Facebook. I'm just going to be, um, Zach Z A C K, um, last name gray G R A Y. Amazing. Yeah, man. Looking forward to following you and, uh, hearing more about your content and your meetups and the, and the, and the action that you have going on uh, on a monthly basis. But well, again, Thank you for hopping on the First Town Legacy Podcast. It's an honor to sit down and talk shop with you. Yeah, 100%, man. Thank you so much for having me. All right, brother. I'll connect with you soon, all right? Take care. Yeah. 
Thank you for joining us on this episode of the First Down Legacy Podcast. We hope you've gained valuable insights and inspiration for your multifamily investing journey. Remember, your legacy in multifamily investing is within reach. Keep learning, keep growing, and keep building your success story. We look forward to having you back with us for more game-changing strategies and stories in the multifamily investing world. Until then, keep the momentum going and keep building that legacy. This is the First Down Legacy Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Oh.